Welcome to Rob School of Music Interviews, and we are featuring today the incredible, I can't even say it, man, Mr. Richard Fortas. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, brother, this is, this is you know, I don't, I'm, I'm speechless, and that doesn't, I'm, I'm a talker, so that doesn't happen often. So thank you so much for your time. So is this, this is like your guitar school, right, in New York? Yeah, so so we have um we have a physical location here in New York. It's uh it's about forty minutes or so outside the city, mm -hmm. and we were doing we were doing lessons. You know, we we had over a hundred students: guitar, bass, drums, piano, audio production, bands. And then COVID came, and uh, we had to move everything virtual. Right. And I just tried to adapt super fast. And um, you know, we've done like over forty five hundred virtual lessons since, which is just a blessing. But yeah, I am Rob from Rob's School of Music. <laughs> All right. So how many of those lessons are, are, uh, one-on-one? -on -one? It's all one-on-one. -on -one. Everything is it private. Is, it is. Okay. Everything yeah. is private. Cool. So like our teaching philosophy is like, we try to, you know, teach someone the way that they kind of want to learn. You know, if they, if they don't want to learn, uh, you know, modes, I'm not going to jam it down the throat. I'm going to say, okay, well, what's a song you like? And then we'll kind of use that song to kind of through the back door, teach them all the things that maybe. Right. They didn't right. Think right. Know. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's super cool. But let's let's start with you. So, like, you know, legendary career. We'll pick it apart along the way and unpack everything. But I think one of the most fascinating questions is like, what was there a particular record or was there a, a show you saw, you know, early on, and you're like, that that's what I want to do. Um, you know, there's so much really because I got. I remember my my uh, I was into music young. I started uh, on violin um, when I was five, and I played violin. I mean, I still play violin. I still, you know, I played all through school. Played cello as well, um, and I also got a drum kit around that age, around six or seven, probably. And I would, I, I remember i don't know if there was a particular moment but i remember there was a show that came on my father was in the music business my father worked for, he's an accountant but he worked for a company that made instruments okay like distributor so it was called st louis music and they made crate amps and ampeg and electra guitars and alvarez and so i was around a bunch of musicians my whole life um and though he wasn't a musician there were always guitars in the house and i was always you know around it and uh so that i was always exposed and you know curious about it and then i remember discovering so i was in the classical when i started um as a kid and then i discovered um you know rock and roll through my i inherited my aunt's record collection Nice. Um, she became a uh, born again Christian and gave me all her secular albums, right? So, it, which was an amazing collection of classic rock. So it was like the Rolling Stones and all the Beatles stuff and Humble Pie and Black Sabbath and uh, you know all this, all the classics. And so that's what I I like just lived that. You know, I mean, it was like the, my greatest treasure was her collection of records and. And I studied everything. And then, you know, that's really what kicked everything off. That's awesome, man. I think, you know, it, it's always cool to see like which elements. I remember like once I started to get into music, um, I made it a point to go back and buy everything on vinyl that all of my heroes were listening to. Um, yeah. you know, like I, I came, I was born in the eighties. So like all the nineties bands, the eighties bands, that's what, you know, I, I grew up on, but I wanted to get the entire Zeppelin collection on vinyl, all the Beatles records on vinyl. Cause I wanted to hear it, how the people that I was being influenced from heard it originally. I think right. something about opening up the record, throwing it on the turntable. I, yep. I was the exact same. I would read every, so my father's company would advertise in all the rock magazines at that time. You know, this is before guitar player. So you had um, Cream magazine and Circus magazine and um, Crawdaddy and 
uh, you know, it was all those type of magazines. So I would read these articles about these artists that I liked and they would talk about their influences. So that's how I would get into, you know, I did the same thing that you did and cool. went back and would listen to their influences. I think it's, it's the coolest way to kind of just, there's so much, um, you know, history with music and then just to kind of see, well, this leads to this and this leads to that. And I heard that lick somewhere else. Oh my God, that guy wrote that lick, but he, no, he didn't. He took it from this guy and it's right, all sharing, right. you know, this knowledge. Mm -hmm. So when, when and it the, just keeps going back further and further. I mean, if you, you get into Zeppelin, right. And then from Zeppelin you go, Oh, well, well, wait, they stole this from lightning Hopkins. So then you go and listen to lightning Hopkins and then you go and listen to muddy waters and uh sun house. And like, you know, it just, it all, you see where they get, get everything, you know, and that's exactly. and how that, where they, cause nothing's truly original, is it? You know, everyone just sort of puts it all together. hundred percent, a hundred percent. So when you were first, you know, getting into guitar and, and starting out was, this is a question that's, there is no right answer to it. So I'll start with that. Um, was, were you letting your ear guide you or were there, was there lessons? Was theory a big part of what was happening? Is it at all? Um, both. I mean, I started out, you know, I, I already had, I learned violin through the Suzuki right. method. Okay. Wow. So my ear was already developed when, by the time I picked up guitar, I was like 12, 13, you know, I'd been, listening and picking out drum parts, you know, and learning all the drum parts to all the, my records, you know, and then, um, you know, that's my ear was pretty keen. And I also had dexterity in my fingers already from violin. So I was able to really pick up and learn guitar really quickly. And I had friends that I learned from and was able to then listen to records and figure out everything. Yeah. Man, now, it's amazing what's available, you know, as far as learning. I mean, YouTube is just like this, it's, it's incredible. It's this wormhole that, you know, you, there's like never a shortage for things to learn. It's it. I, I have so many videos saved of things. It's like, I feel like I'll never be able to learn in my lifetime, everything that there is out there that I want to learn because there's so many people. And I feel like this is something that we deal with with our students here is there's all of these uh, Instagram guitarists that are just completely shredding, melting your face right off down to the bone. It's just disgusting. But right. I feel like some of these younger players, you know, they'll come to me and be like, Rob, you know, like, here, check out this video. I'll never be able to do that. I'm like, dude, I'll never be able to do that. Like, don't don't let that frighten you. Like, But what's fascinating is, is that most of them won't be able to do it either. Most of the people that did the videos because they're speeding it up. They're slow. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, that whole thing. So, oh, I mean, you, you have to take that with a grain of salt. I mean, it, it's interesting because it, it's such a interesting phenomenon that somebody can become a guitar, famous guitar player via the internet. You know, to me, it just seems so strange that, you know, they're sitting at home playing with, you know, writing tracks, whatever, you know, and recording and then miming along with them to make it look like they're just you know it, it it's all just smoke and mirrors in a lot of ways i dude i love you said that because you just literally lifted up the curtain and that's something i'm saying all the time like don't you got to choose to be inspired by this don't be intimidated because there's a lot of trickery going on that uh you know people don't don't really realize so i completely agree with mm -hmm. what you're saying there. it was strange too the um the last time i was out at the nam show the last nam show there was you know the lines to meet these Instagram guitarists were as long or longer than, you know, the Steve I line. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Like, really? Like, yeah, it was, it was gnarly in the weirdest way. And I'm like, I'm not putting these people down. Like they're, they're talented. Like, don't, don't, I don't want to misquote myself there, but I don't know. Like I find like a big thing we do here is we take all of our students. I call them all kids that just they're kids in their journey, beginners in their musical journey. And uh, we put everyone into bands. We put them into a group. We have a big jam room in the back. We have, um, we're right on the main road in our town here. So we have twice a year, they have like a big street fair and we have all the kids play, all the musicians play. And, um, you know, being in a band, a lot of young musicians, they're not playing with bands. They're just jamming with YouTube or jamming with themselves. And I think to me, like 
when you're playing with other people in the room and there's the pulse and the give and the take, mm -hmm. I think that's important, right? Yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, that to me, that's all music is. I mean, it, it's really strange to, for me to sit around and play because, uh, you know, music is a language. It's, uh, you're conversing with somebody, you're having a conversation with somebody when you're jamming with them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I grew up doing that. Like, we would just, we get together and we'd all play, you know, and everyone would, you know, it was just, it's what it was. And you were, it, it's just very different when it's so isolated. But, you know, it's the hardest thing about getting into a band is when I was a kid was finding people that were like-minded, you know, that were into the same type of stuff as you and were as driven and as passionate about it as you are. And, uh, you know, I see my daughter, I have a 13 year old and she's in a school like, like you have, and she's this, she's a singer and guitar player in a band. And, uh, yeah, she loves it. But she's really fortunate that she was able to hook up with and connect with kids that are into the same type of stuff as she is. They're older than she is, but you know, it's she's uh, she loves it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think finding the right people is very important. I mean, we we had a particular group of kids here that unfortunately a lot of them have gone off to school, but it was like right. some older some older guys playing guitar, a younger guy playing drums, and a younger girl singing. And this girl singing. Mm -hmm. And, and rush and van halen and i'm like what year were you born like like this is incredible that this still exists in the next generation that's probably my favorite part about you know this whole music school thing is getting to watch the next generation coming up and you know right it's not sensical you know rock is dead thing that that's really not true you know there's still a lot of people coming out there who want to rock out and I, and I love it hmm. that's great yeah my my daughter's not into any of that <laughs> yeah she's really more into indie stuff and you know. cool too yeah, yeah, it, yeah music is music that's that's the coolest thing but i think having you know dudes like you you know you're out there like all right let's let's do this question okay so we're going to start at now and we'll work our way backwards so so you've been okay. a member of guns and roses for 20 years now right just that, about yeah which is incredible from the Chinese democracy lineup all the way through, you know, the original guys coming back and you're just there the whole time as an incredible, incredible constant. When that gig first arose, what was your process in having to learn all of that material? Cause I think that's very daunting for a young musician. You know, how do I learn all the songs? Um, you know, it, I did a gig, uh, about, nine ten years ago i did a tour with a band called thin lizzie yep, and they were a huge influence on me so for me to learn that stuff and that's pretty complicated stuff you know there's a lot of harmonies and it's like the um the real the nuances are it's much more nuanced so learning um you know, had the matching vibrato to, cause there's so many harmonies, you know, with, with Scott, with the other guitar player. So matching his vibrato and, you know, there it was, I really spent a lot of time on that and shedded every day. So I would sit, get my cup of coffee, you know, write down my notes. And I, you know, I don't like to, when I'm doing a gig like that, I don't like to write music out because then I find that I rely on it. So I force myself just to eschew that, just stick with the music or with my, uh, just listening with my ear and going over it and over it and over it, you know, and you just play it just like you do with any song. You, know, you sit, you listen to it and you really pay attention to the details, you know, and the little things and then trying to figure out, uh, I mean, now there's, you know, when I started with GNR, there, it wasn't, like it is now even though it was you know just 20 years ago you didn't have the internet with of every song from every band you know available with you know somebody sitting there showing you how to play it um you know and a lot of times just so you're aware you want to watch like six or seven different videos of those you know people because they're they're all have different they all have different takes on it and yes. you'll think you know what that's not right that's I mean, I watch videos of my, uh, you know, where people are 
doing my stuff and i'm like wait a second that's not right <laughs> but you know everybody has their own take on it you know and so you listen to as many as you can or videos like now if i'm learning something you know and i want to go watch a to get me in the ballpark and then i just use my ear and i because nine times out of ten it's it's a little bit off um, but yeah, I sat down and when I started with guns, I sat down and really focused on the parts and listened. And then if there were any live videos of the original band that I could see, you know, I would watch as much as I could to find, you know, but you hear if somebody is doing something up on the seventh fret or if they're doing something down at the bottom of the neck, because there's so many enharmonic notes across the guitar, you know, where you have the same note in different places so mm -hmm. or the same chord so you can in different voicings so you know you really have to and a lot of times it's when i'm learning songs nine times out of ten i'm always going to go with whatever is the easiest because that's generally what it was what it what they were doing originally totally agree. you know and yeah. you know you think man how did they voice that and then switch here and you know pick this up and and then you're like wait a second it's all just they used a capo and it's in the second fret. You know, there's like, <laughs> you know, it's it's almost always easier than what you think it is initially. Yeah. I love that you said that regarding the videos out there. I always try and tell the students, you know, there is no governing force on YouTube nor ultimateguitar.com saying if this is right or wrong. And that really forces you to use your ear to exactly you said, well, that doesn't sound right. Let's figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Guitar is tricky like that. It really is, yeah. You know, piano, there's only one place you can play a middle C, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I use that right. There's a there's a piano in every lesson room here. So back when we had in person lessons, I was constantly referencing like this is laid out literally in black and white for you. And now we have this right. mess of wire and wood, and we're gonna figure out how we can play the same note, you know, twelve different ways. <laughs> yeah. And in school, when you're in music school, you know, that's you know, you've gotta it, it you, everyone has to learn theory on piano because like you said it's literally in black and white but um getting back to your uh, uh, question about learning uh, when i was growing up so i started off by ear and then i started taking lessons um you know i think you and i still do i still take lessons you know i still buy instructional things you know even my friend you know from my friends you know um when they put out something new i'll buy it and you know because i'm just constantly trying to you know you're, you're i'm always looking for inspiration in any way you know and so i'm always still learning you know and i'm i still have a teacher that i go to occasionally you know when i'm it's it's really when you want to because through your musical journey it's always there's hills and plateaus and valleys you know it's like any journey sure. and sometimes to get out of those plateaus to move up again you need something to inspire you, you need somebody to open a door for you i completely agree completely agree and, and that's especially guitarists i find a lot of them plateau you know i'll you know be holding auditions for a gig or something and we need a, a rhythm guitarist and he'll come in and he's playing the same way he played when he was 13 years old because he learned one thing and never learned anything else and right. I think we need those disruptors for me. Like I, in my teaching style, like, yeah, we're going to give you the tools for whatever direction you want to go, but I'm going to make sure you learn those seventh chords and you're going to learn your inversions and you're going to learn your modes just because these are things to do it for me. When I went to college, I was a rocker through and through and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to take a minor in jazz guitar. Cause I need to, I need to get better at this thing. And it just turned my whole world world upside down. And I'm still a rock guitar player, but just having that vocabulary, I completely but agree. But you're like, a rock guitar player that can play over changes. Exactly. <laughs> right. Which is my secret superpower. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. I mean, it's essential when you're, when you're a professional. I mean, you know, you've got to have those skills there. You yeah. don't have to always sound like you can do that, but it's in your back pocket when you need to hundred percent. And that's the best place to have it. Oh, look what I can do. Right. Uh, okay. So in terms of the, the gigs and everything, one of the, the, usually the question I open up with, but I kind of wanted to wait a minute before we got to it is 
dude, you've played on stages that I can't even fathom the amount of people and, and the, the moving parts going on and everything. And, and for such an incredible career throughout so many different, you know, steps through it. When musicians are starting out, uh, one of the biggest things when we put our students into bands and have them play that, you know, they get stage fright, they're nervous, anxiety, all those sort of things. And, and, you know, we could go into a whole rabbit hole about how life does that to you also, but I'm always curious to hear, you know, do you have any tips how, you've dealt with those sort of things or does that not even happen any longer or can you remember? Um, no, it, it does. You know, especially when it's a situation where, you know, it, uh, when I'm touring with GNR, it's like the stage is the most comfortable place to me, you know, because it's our stage. It's, it's, our gear it's our in-ear mixes you know it's our physical stage it's the same every night and it feels like being at home cool okay but when you go to play a club or when you go to sit in with somebody you're nervous you know because now you're not at home you're in somebody else's home and but you know it's just part of life, man. You know, that's, you just got to do it. And the only way to get over it is to do it, you know? And I grew up when I was 15 years old, I was playing clubs, you know, yeah. every weekend we were playing clubs, you know, my, my band, we started playing and there, but when I was a kid in, I grew up in St. Louis and there were underage clubs. Mm -hmm. So I would play every week at an underage club, you know, and we played different underage clubs and, you know, and parties and stuff. And that's how I got over that. Yeah. You know, it became, it became comfortable for me. I totally, you know, for me, and this is kind of, you know, and I love that perspective. Actually, I, it's a weird connection there. Cause when I asked that question to, uh, to Bumblefoot, Ron, um, he had a very similar response as to when it's on the, you know, full stage with it's my gear, it's no big deal when it's some fly date and it's, it's, you know, SAR is giving me the back line and, and the amp's not working. That's a different story. Right. Right. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a very shy person outside of music. I've had this mustache since I'm 13 because of my, my Italian heritage. So I was able to get into the all age clubs always. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I overcame all that sort of stuff. But I, I completely agree. It, it is a part of life and getting through it is just, you know, it's, it comes with the gig. But drinking age was 18, right? No, it was still 21 for me. It's 21. It was yeah. 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't drinking, but I mean, I was, I was in the, you know, right. Right. Well, of course not. Yeah. I don't know. Never. Um, um, yeah. So, so, uh, so you had Ron on. Yeah. Yeah. And that guy can play, that guy can play anything. He, he, the first time we talked about, you know, just similar stuff that we're talking about the second time, he literally gave us a crash course in the business side of things like publishing and pitching stuff to, you know, for sinks. And, and I was just sitting there like, I'm trying to interview, but I'm taking notes at the same time because I'm like, Oh, Oh, oh professor. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So you've done yep. a, a fair amount of session work as well. Now, when you're preparing for a gig like that, is that a similar thing where you're just listening to the material before? Does someone tell you? It's it's rare that you go into a session having music beforehand. Right. I mean, I, I would, you know, most of the sessions that I did, I was living in New York. Um, and I would just go from session to session mm -hmm. every day. Like I'd have, I would have, a, I had a cartridge company that would take, you know, I'd talk to the producer and I'd find out what they were looking for, what the what the gig was, you know, was it a hip hop session? What was he looking for, like a big rock guitar sound? Was he looking for, you know, nylon string? You know, you sort of suss it out mm -hmm. what, what they're looking for. And then I would know what gear I wanted to send to that gig, to that session. And then I would make notes and I'd have my cartridge company, I'd say, you know, hey, take take uh, an AC 30, you know, the number four AC 30, and then take uh, my 64 330, 
Rickenbacker for that gig. Um, and then I would usually bring pedals myself. Like I would pick out what I wanted. You know, everything was like, you know, a big part of being a professional, especially a session player, is knowing your gear and knowing how to speak the same language as the producer. And to do that, you have to know your music history. You know, you have to know if he says, so producers generally don't speak in, they speak a very unique language. I mean, as musicians, we speak in references a lot of times. So he'll, they'll say, you know, I'm looking for, I want to do like a big Paul Kossoff type of solo on this, but I want the verses are real, like um, Tom Petty ish, uh, you know, Mike Campbell type of uh, tone. And then, you know, looking for a T Rex type chorus sound, you know, and then knowing, okay, well, Kossoff. <laughs> Kossoff is a, a, you know, I'm going to take a burst and I'm going to take a, a 50 watt Les Paul or a 50 watt uh, Marshall. Um, and then for the Tom Petty stuff, okay, I need a an AC30 or a, you know, basement. And then, you know, the, you just, you know how to get the sounds there that producer is looking for and how to deliver, you know, and then being able to, to, to go, okay, this is the type of part. And that's what gets you hired, you know? That's what gets you hired again. Because the producer knows that he can make references and you're going to know. You know, if he says, and that, you know, you have to, not just classic rock, but you have to have, if they say, well, you know, I'm looking for like a, um, uh, Yo Bum Rush the Show type guitar part or she watched channel zero that type of thing but like a portis head type of trippy you know you, you know you know the references and and so speaking that language you know because as musicians we're obsessed with music right and we always listen and you need to listen to everything if you want to do that type of work you have to and and not only know the references know how to play it and know what they were using how to get that sound how, you know that's awesome what a cool perspective you know i've spoken to a couple of session guys throughout this and no one explained it that well that that really you know kind of made me I'm, as you're saying those things i'm like okay well what would i bring how could i make that it's almost like a painter and you know how to mix the certain right. color that's get, i use yeah. that i use that analogy often i mean really i a lot of guys, you know, like like Ron, um, will will you? He is a very he does his thing. You know, he doesn't have a huge um, palette to work from. You know, uh, because he's he's very. I mean, he he like I said, he can play anything harmonically. Like as far as with his fingers, he's capable of anything. There's nothing that guy can't play. Um, but I think the reason I worked as much as I did as a session player was because I was able to speak that language and I knew all the reference points and I knew all the gear, you know, and there's a million guys that can play what needs to be played nine times out of 10, man. I know I've said nine times out of 10, quite a few times already today, but, but really the stuff that you need to play is not going to be hard. It's not going to be complicated. Most of the stuff that sessions that you're playing, you know, you're playing stuff that's boring, you know, (laughs) you know, you're playing, you're not, not boring. It's, it's stylized, you know, you're doing what's essential and it's not like super flashy, you know, most times. And occasionally it's going to happen. You know, they're going to say, Hey, do a solo here. That's like, you know, like just totally go for it. You know, and then you can be as flashy as you want to be, you know? Yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, playing to the gig, right? Like, you, you know, you know, right. you're rolling right. in this, this And as event. a session player, you, you're, you're, it's not about you. Mm-hmm. It's about the song. Sure. And it's about giving them, giving the producer what he wants, you know? So then speaking of gear, um, mm-hmm. you just referenced 
such incredible equipment. Um, what is your, your opinion? And there's no wrong answer here, but um, with modeling technology, you know, it's come pretty far, but at the end of the day, I use modeling technology every day. I've been using it for years. I've been using it since it first started out, like with the, wow. uh, with the line six stuff. Um, you know, I did pop gigs where it was essential to have, be able to switch scene changes, you know, where you're dramatically, cause you, if you're doing a pop gig, you're, you're covering 20 different players Mm -hmm. um so okay like i toured with um enrique iglesias um or, or better example rihanna I toured with rihanna rihanna has a, a ton of different people producing and playing and writing you know her stuff so you know in in the course of a show i'm covering 20 different guitar players and 20 different producers you know so you've got to cover a really wide range of sonic territory yeah and so modeling amps are really useful because you can do complete scene changes and what else you can do is they're all midi uh oh technical difficulties I don't know if you can still hear me. You there? Oh, we can always edit this part out. No worries. I'm not sure if you can hear me still. Hmm. Hmm. All right, I'm going to try and take Richard out, see if I put him back in, if that'll, there it goes. All right, hopefully he'll come back on in a second. So you're watching Rob School of Music live interview here with Mr. Richard Fortas. Thank you so much for hanging with us here today, guys. You know, things can happen with technology. So you guys watching this live stream, you're getting to see something that will be edited out of the replay. But. Hope all is well out there. Thank you so much for being here. And we do this every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern time. We have some amazing players coming up. We have Rod Castro, plays with BB Rexa, does all the guitars for Beyonce. Andy Wood coming up at the end of the month. Paul Pesco, legends. Derek Sherinian. We're doing a talk with Matt Halpern, special Monday morning chat in a couple weeks. Um, tell us a joke. Well, one time we're on a live stream, and then it was just Rob. All right. Been on a laugh? Come on. <laughs> well, it's like my own little podcast here, guys. Thanks for hanging out. Hopefully Richard will pop back on here. Not sure, not sure what's going on just yet, but it's a cool chat so far. Um, and of course, we have record talk tonight here. We have record talk. So then remember, every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do these live stream interviews. And of course, you can always rewatch them. We have an incredible, thank you so much, Eliana. I appreciate that support. Thank you. Thank you from Argentina. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we do these live streams and you can always rewatch them. Rob School of Music, if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, we have Nita Strauss, Devin Townsend. Bruce Kulik, Mark Letiri, you know, just about a year's worth of interviews. And then at 9 p.m. every Wednesday, Eastern Standard Time, we do a separate show called Record Talk, where myself and a couple friends from around uh, the United States here, we we just pick apart records. And it's just a bunch of guys nerding out. Today, tonight, we're talking about the debut album, self-titled from the band Garbage. Shirley Manson, fantastic vocalist, great band. And then we have some other ones coming up. We're talking about Oasis, Alice in Chains, so... Please, if you're watching this, like and subscribe to uh, YouTube Rob School of Music. And, you know, I'm not sure. I was, I was hoping you would pop back on. Let's check the old email here. Let's see if we've missed anything.
All right, let's see if let's see if we can make this work. Stand by, ladies and gentlemen, stand by. Ah. All right, so he's having some weather difficulty, unfortunately. Um where he is, the big storms, the internet may have gone down. So we may have to postpone the remainder of this. So I'm going to keep communicating and see what's going on. We may have to uh, continue this a second time, perhaps a part two, a part two. That'd be fantastic. All right. All right. Talk amongst yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. Let's see what we got here. We got a little bit of music we can play. Wait, Side. why am I sideways? I don't know. <laughs> uh, hang um, oh, I'm gonna try and take you out and put you back in. See if I can fix. There. there he is. There he is. It's all right. All right. Sorry, I don't know what happened. That's the first time it's ever happened to me. No worry. That's the first time it's happened to me too. I threw on some. I told some jokes. I got all these like a uh, little. Uh, I threw on one of these little sad trombones. I got um. We're having a big storm here, so I wonder if my internet went out because of that. But it came back, so. Cool. Oh, good. No worries, brother. It happens. All right. um, so what were we talking about? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to subside my own panic attack while we were away, so I don't, I don't, I don't remember where we left off. Um, um, we're okay. talking well, gear, modeling stuff. That's what we're talking about. So. Um, oh, right, right, right. So, Very good. So. Uh, so so modeling was a big. You know, I'm. I still have an Axe FX three right here. Um, you know, a camper. I use, I use the Ox. I see yours back there. Yeah, I use that every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I never. I always use real mics as well. I always use a. Re, I always use a real amp. I'll use. Um. I'll use an axe effect sometimes to supplement. So in other words, I'll put like, I'll model one amp on one side, another on the other side, and then put um, a real amp in the middle. You know, I'll mic up a real amp. Yeah, uh, same with the IRs, the same with, um, uh, with the aux, with the speakers. I'll, um, I will use a tube amp, but I'll also, and I'll be using a modeled cab, taking a step out, but I'll also have a mic'd cabinet as well. Cool. I like the hybrid kind of, you know, making, I think that's the, 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 my, my philosophy on it is they're all tools. So use what we have access to, right. you know, if, if taking an Axe effects or a Kemper on the road makes it sound the same everywhere you are and you don't have a lot of people to set up your gear, then there is nothing wrong with that. You know, it's only right. guitar players who stand at the lip of the stage or at the back of the room and look down at your pedal board and say, Oh my gosh, that's a, there's boss pedals on there and not some crazy boutique pedal. Ugh. Right. Right. It's just now I, I will say that like, you know, slash and I both tried Kemper's out in rehearsal once. Um, it doesn't work for us for for what i do with gnr it doesn't work um because we rely so much on our volume knobs on our guitars yeah um 
So in other words, I use a single channel amp with with guns. And really? and I just it's all about the volume knob. So if I want to clean sound, I just roll my volume down. And wow. with a tube amp, with a tube amp, it cl- it gets clean and pretty sparkly, you know. And that slash does the same thing. And always there's there's so many tones just within your volume control, mm-hmm. you know. And we're always all if you watch live videos, we're both of us are constantly on our volume knobs because we're always just subtly adjusting things to get the exact sound that we want. I love it. You it's know, like a lot of art, you know. It is because a lot of people now, if I was in news or Metallica and and I was just wide open and I was either getting a really clean sound or a really dirty sound, you know, it, a camper would work, you know, an axe effects would work. But, but all subtleties and nuances are, are lost with that stuff. Completely. So agree. for what guns does, you know, Joe Bonamassa use a camper and get by, but use can, and it's still effective, you know, Mm-hmm. Totally agree. When, um, so we spoke earlier before we were on air regarding your work with BT. I, I love his work. How, how did that relationship, you know, forge? Um, man, I have been, I've been working with BT since I guess movement and still life. We did, um, I've done worked on so many movies with him. He's a fantastic composer. I actually was just doing uh, um, today. Did a uh, classical guitar cue for him for a video game. Wow, a video game score. Uh, we've been, yeah, we've been. I, I, I forget how I originally got connected with him. I probably through manager to do a session to work with him on uh, either a movie. Now, you know, um, because I think the first movie he was Go, and uh, and then we did we did a ton of stuff together. And I love working with him. I actually just did a new project with where we this is going to get pretty heady, but we we rented out this old studio, it's the studio that's in a 150 year old church. And we, they specialize in Atmos recordings, mo- mainly classical. So Atmos is um, a system that where if you have a, um, it's immersive audio, okay? So if you've got like 120 different speakers, you know, all around a room, you know, a lot of movie theaters now are switching to Atmos. So you'll have all these speakers and basically what we did was we had a combination of guitar and or cello whatever i was doing and him sending all these audio signals to all these different speakers and then each speaker was mic so we had i think 28 different speakers throughout this church it 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 sounds it's hard to get your head around really but it's we did it just because we wanted to do this experimental record. And uh, it's just now, we did it last year, and now it's just coming to fruition where we're actually getting it mixed. And, uh, you know, so we have to go to, we have to go to Skywalker Ranch to mix it because we're one of the only facilities that has a, anyways. Dude, he's, I he, he's that level of genius, though, you know. I love it, dude. I, I will nerd out on that stuff all day long. I'm on Clubhouse all the time listening to these guys talk about, you know, that level of brain power. And I'm like, please just feed it to me. You know, I think the he's one that sent me my Clubhouse invite. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've i been in a few different rooms with him. Um, but yeah, he's he's a true genius. Awesome. I, you know, it's it's funny. I, I, I was in the process of purchasing um, the stutter edit too. And I sent him a DM on Instagram and I was like, dude, like, can I apply this to guitar? And he says, Richard Fortas does it all the time. 
And I was like, oh, okay, well, then that's the stamp of approval I need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm trying to get him on here. I'd love, I'd love to, you know, feature him too. Cause we, we get a lot of guitar players. We don't get a lot of people on that side of the musical spectrum and we have an audio production program. So I know, you know, the students would eat that up, but awesome brother. Wow. Yeah, man. He's, he's an incredible talent. It's just difficult to follow him. You know what I mean? Cause he's so lofty um, to, it, it's easy to do i have to stop him all the time i'm like i, I need you to bring it down <laughs> you need to dumb it down about 20 decibels you know he's uh he he's just so crazy smart yeah dude but i think i think but, it's inspiring man i think it's cool yeah, you know it, it is it, it's definitely he's an inspiring person to be around awesome and his orchestral scores are absolutely stunning they're they're it, they're so good and he gets better and better with every project it's it's inspiring dude it's you know i think that's for any guitar students you know watching this i think this opens up your mind to the bigger picture that music is music and you know it doesn't matter what the i i i'm gonna butcher the analogy but it's like if you were a um if you created art and you uh, you drew pen, you drew with a pen and ink, you're not a pen and ink er. You're an artist, and just the pen is your tool. So, as musicians, like guitar is my primary way of getting the sound out of me. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways. And I think hearing you know the appreciation for other musicians and hearing the appreciation of other styles, we're, we're all on the same team. You know, we're trying to do the same thing, and it's just it's super inspiring. Yeah, well, I mean, it, guitar might be your medium, but mm -hmm. you know, music is art, and yes. you know, that's just because you're a painter doesn't mean you can't sculpt as well. Exactly, you get it. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Now we're gonna we're gonna do a gear question uh, before we get to my this or that series. Um, if you were on a desert island <laughs> and you can have one guitar and one amp and one pedal um what would you take with you um probably a really long guitar cord to hang myself <laughs> <laughs> best answer yet <laughs> um man okay okay i would say my 73 Les Paul signature is a very obscure guitar. It, it, but it is the most versatile guitar and that I own probably and inspiring. Um, do you know what they are? I don't. I'm, I'm like, my phone's to the side. I'm like, can I casually look on reverb as he's talking? Wait, <laughs> I could, I can show you one. Um, okay. Cool. And a tweed twin. Cool. Uh, and then uh, a clon. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, just because if you're going to have one pedal, I yeah. mean, yeah. I, I or, asked or, that. or better yet, an archer. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a little more uh, stable. Um, I asked that question to uh, it, Zach it, Meyer. It's not that he's more stable. It's just that you're not going to feel as bad if you get sand on the, you know, from the iron right, 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 right. the pedal. <laughs> oh my gosh! Can you imagine? And it's it's the exact same thing. So yeah. anybody that tells you that it's not, or that they can hear a difference, I've had clons. I've used clons live in my live rig. There's no difference. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna grab my signatures right here. Cool. Okay. This is a 1973 picture. Okay. Now it's got it's you know obviously a gold top. It's got the pickups are low impedance and high impedance. Okay, there's a high impedance out here on the front. Sorry, right there. And then that's the low impedance. Okay. Wow. Why do you want low impedance pickups? If you're recording direct, 
it's a really cool sound. Um, how much do you use it? Very rarely, but it's cool to have. The, it, okay, when I was in New York doing sessions and going from studio to studio every day, if I didn't know what the producer wanted, if I didn't have an idea of what was going on, I would bring this guitar. Wow. Um, because it's so versatile. Okay, so there's there's an in and out of phase switch here. There's also a mid sweep. There's like a frequency bump that is 50, 200, or 500. And it's, um, so there's so many different tones you can get with this guitar. I've never and seen it. It's awesome. Yeah. They're, um, uh, if you know the meters, Leo used one of these. Um, not a lot of players used them. Otherwise, they'd be much more valuable because they only made them for a couple of years. I think 73 to 75. Wow. Wow. Now, you, sir, yeah. you have quite the guitar collection. I remember there was a premier guitar or some, someone, someone chronicled your your library of instruments. Um, yeah, I have quite a few, and I'm selling a lot of them. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah? I'm always in the market for new guitars. I'm buying a burst. But I also, I, I also have uh, a lot of amplifiers. A lot of <laughs> amplifiers. Way well, I too do. many. But it makes sense, though, because, you know, it, it's you have every color you could possibly need if you need it. And that I like to, yeah, like I, we were talking about, I like to have a very large palette. Yeah. To awesome. Paint with, yeah. All right. So, so then, we're, yeah, we're going to pick your brain then on some of your choices here. So this is my ending segment for the show. Okay. Um, uh, just because I know you, you got to get out of here um, for other things, but it's a series of this or that questions. You can answer just one or the other. You don't have to justify it, but feel free to justify your answer. That makes it more fun. There are no wrong answers with the exception of one. I believe there is an incorrect answer, and that's just my super strong opinion, but we'll see what happens. Okay. All, All right. right. Humbucker or single coil? Oh, that. Uh, yeah, these questions suck. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's. I can answer that. I mean... <laughs> And 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 what qualifies a humbucker? I mean, is that two coils? Because is a filtertron a humbucker? Yeah, yeah, I know that it's mean, not easy. Um, yeah, man, I I don't know that I could pick one or another. Okay. I mean, you get a pass. That's okay. We'll go to the next. P nineties. Cool. I know. I know. PAFs. <laughs> tellies. I uh, man. You I know mean. What? You there's, just, there's no way I could pick between. But you just made my day because I've asked that question to about 50 different incredible musicians along the way. And everyone so quickly just says one or the other. But you're a million percent right that there are a million notches down as you go from, well, what is a humbucker? And then what if it's a mini humbucker? That sounds different than a humbucker and so on and so completely forth. Completely different. Yeah. Completely different. Yeah. So, I mean... I use this guitar. <laughs> That's a 53 Esquire with a PAF in the neck. Okay. I use that just as much as I use this guitar, which is a 1963 Um Okay. So the guitar, there's three guitars sitting right here to my right. Um, one is a 1953 Les Paul gold top with P90s. One is the the 60 335 with PAFs and then my tell uh telly um and and then right here is my signature model grit so i mean i use those all the time i'm constantly you know and okay and then i've got a jazz mass a 62 jazz master uh another telly uh a strat to a two strats a 6120 you know it, it's like those are essentials. Those are my. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, what's the, your next question? So wait, so Les Paul, so a humbucker or Les Paul, a humbucker or single coil? The correct answer is yes, I guess. For <laughs> yes, uh, 
Les Paul or Strat? If you just, just yes. boom. Yes. Okay. And then Strat or Telly? Yes. Um, uh, you know what? I would, I, I love both. I probably go for a Telly more, more often. I absolutely go for a Telly more often than I go for my Strat. Okay, cool. All right. So we got one definitive one so far. Um, Les Paul or SG? A Les Paul. Okay. It's it, it, a very, very, very rarely do I think, you know, what? I really need an SG on this. You know, it, it's uh, it's a Les Paul or 335, you know, cool. or a Firebird. Okay. SG is not an essential to me. I agree with that thoroughly. Um, okay, if you were to grab a bass, would it be a P bass or a jazz bass? I prefer P basses most of the time. Okay. For an acoustic, a Martin or a Taylor? Oh, God. A Martin. Okay, thank you. Also I, the right I, I, there's nothing wrong with Taylors. Taylors have their place, not in my world, but if you, for the price point, you know, Taylor makes a very consistent, homogenized guitar. It's it's very consistent. They're always going to sound good. They're always going to play good. They're uh, C and C meticulously. They're but but a Martin is handmade. Right. And uh, I'm back. <laughs> Gone again. <laughs> it's yeah. it's getting in and out. Um. <laughs> I hear your voice. So it's okay. Okay. So Martin's. Yeah. I prefer Martin's always. Okay. You know, it's why I, I ask and design all these questions. If you can see the guitars around me, I I've been mm -hmm. working with PRS guitars since 2007. And I don't even ask that as an option because I'm just trying to go like ultra traditional, you know, with, yeah. yeah. You know, Gibson or Martin would be a better question yeah. for me. And that really depends on the song. It's all about the song. And do I use a double O? Do I use a parlor? You know, it, it depends if I'm doing a finger picking thing. You know, there's so many nuances, you know. I know. I, know. I, I They're not easy. I know it. If I'm doing a big strummy, strummy thing, you know, just straight eights, I'm going to go with a J200. Okay. All right. For effect pedals, we'll go quick on these. Delay or reverb? Wait, I have to pick one? You got to pick one. EP3. If if I had to, yeah, I would go with a delay, a tape delay. Already? Fuzz or overdrive? I love them both. Um, I probably use overdrive more. Okay. More practical. I get that. Phaser or chorus? Oh, God. Phaser all day long. That's the one. chorus. That's the right answer. Thank you. Okay, we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> i've um, never been a chorus fan even when chorus was popular yeah phaser it is always just sounded cheesy to me yep i agree i agree a phaser like you can screw with the rate and you can get so many different colors and flavors out of it phase um, 90 all day long yes sir one knob all you need oh, or a, unless you can afford a buy phase well, I'm a... oh, all right I'm back. phase nine I'm... okay <laughs> All right, I got time for one more before I got to let you go. Um, uh, Is that it? I got one more. Okay. I got one more. Okay, all right. Uh, Beatles or Stones? Oh, God, that's a tough one. Man, I don't know that I could pick because I okay. love them both so much. Fair and they're, to me, it's black and white. They're total opposites, but they're both essential. 100%. They both provide tremendous value. I totally agree. Dude, this is, I don't want to keep you past when, when I know, but thank you so, so much for your time. Um, this has been so incredible. Thank you so much. When I repost this, I will chop out our little blip in the middle there, but thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate getting to hang with you tonight. Yeah, man. It's been a pleasure. It's been great talking to you. Awesome, man. Well, thank you. you Sorry stay... about the uh, computer the issues. The uh... it, It's technology. We're lucky that we get to do this at all. I, I'm, I'm in New York. I'm not sure which state you're in, but I'm pretty sure you're not in New York also. So <laughs> no the magic of the internet. All right, all right man. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Stay safe. All right. I'll see you. You too.